came in nature, a journey in search of a peaceful and prosperous society with human nature as a guide. Led by your host, Adam Heyman. Hey, everybody. Adam Heyman here. Welcome to Heyman Nature. Um, my buddy Tyrone is not here with me today because I am very proud to say I'm doing my first interview for the show. I hope there will be many, many more. And I am interviewing Stefan Kinsella, who will be well known to my libertarian audience. Um, we had a great conversation. In fact, it went so long, I'm going to be cutting it into two episodes of this show. Um, so let me give you a little background. His official bio is as follows. Stefan Kinsella is a libertarian writer and a patent attorney in Houston, Texas. He has spoken, lectured, and published widely on various areas of libertarian legal theory and on legal topics such as intellectual property law and international law. And uh, he's done a lot of books and articles, too many to count, but the two that will come up in the discussion today are Legal Foundations of a Free Society, which just came out uh, late last year, and also Against Intellectual Property, which first came out in the early 2000s and was published a little bit later by the Mises Institute. Um, so it's a great uh, interview. I'm sure you're going to love it just as uh, as much as I you're going to have as much fun listening to it as, as I had recording it. Uh, Stefan's a great guy and super, super smart, as you will soon see. So welcome to part one of my interview with Stefan Kinsella. Hello, and welcome to Heyman Nature. I am just as pleased as punch to have as my very first interview guest, one Stefan Kinsella. Stefan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adam. This is my fourth, my fifth first interview. There must be something about you. Everybody wants you to uh, break their cherry, so to speak. So I, I hope you're gentle. I assume that means you're gentle. I'm very gentle. <laughs> so listeners and viewers have heard your official bio just now, but I want to give you a better intro. Uh, Stefan, you are one of the smartest people in our intellectual movement, in my opinion. Uh You've made huge contributions to libertarian polit political theory, libertarian legal theory. Um, your intellectual property work is legendary. Um, your work on contract theory. But I think the viewers should know something more about who you are. And to illustrate that, I want to talk about what happened last year uh, in New Hampshire. I went to Porkfest this year for the very first time, <clears throat> and I hit you up because you sometimes go to these things. And I said, Hey, you coming to pork fest this year? And you said something like, uh, sure. Sounds like a hoot. Be right there. And then, um, pork fest is the porcupine festival held by the free state project in New Hampshire, whereby they throw a little week long party with intellectual speeches, debates, uh, food, drink activities, camping, Festival festivities of all kinds in an attempt to entice liberty loving people to move to New Hampshire and use the democratic process to make it better. But what's really cool about this particular time, we were there having a great time. And when Stefan, when you arrived, you sauntered up and said, Hey, did you guys know that just 30 minutes down the road is the huge uh, resort hotel where they signed the Bretton Woods agreement? And we go, no. And you said, uh, want to go see it? <laughs> and uh, I was there with a bunch of my uh, Libertarian Party of Nevada buddies. And we're like, yeah, of course we want to go see it. Are you kidding? So we went and it was awesome and creepy. And that joint reminded me of the Overlook Hotel in the, in the Shining. And uh, it was just awesome. And I thought it was one of the coolest things we could have done there. And that was all due to you. So thank you, good sir. Uh, you're welcome. It was fun for me too. Um, yeah, it was like I, like, I like going to museums and things like that where they're small, where you can like see it in, you know, 30 minutes or an hour. And like you have like, the, like the Louvre is too much and the British right. Museum, you know, I mean, they're nice, but they're too much. But this was like a nice little thing. And by the way, no one was there. Like we were the only ones there who even knew <laughs> what it was. And we were all like going crazy on the plaques and the, I mean, we were hating it, but we were loving it, you know, so no, that was fun. 
Like, it was so fun. Yeah, no, like the people who work there, it's like they didn't even know. It was so interesting. Because it's just a like a, a resort hotel, right? I mean, and who knew all these evil machinations occurred. So <clears throat> the show is called Heyman Nature, and uh, it's a cute little pun. But what we're trying to do is study human nature and the nature of reality and try and come up with a vision of what the proper systems for humans ought to be. Um, you know, how in accordance with our nature, how should we set up, set up our lives, our social institutions, our legal institutions. And that's why I'm so happy to talk to you. Um, you have a book that just came out. I've got a copy. You were happy, uh, kind enough to send me. A Legal Foundations for a Free Society, or of a Free Society. And uh, I haven't read it yet, but I've looked through the uh, table of contents, and I've already listened to you speak and read what you have to say on several of these topics, and I'm just, I'm just thrilled to death that you put it all together into this book. So maybe you could tell me uh, a little bit about it and what prompted you to put it all together like this. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I talk to other libertarian and and authors and academics, you know, um, who do things like this podcast nowadays, uh, publishing in the old days and still now today. Um, I'm a little bit different because I'm not trying to make tenure. I'm not an academic, although I've published more than most academics <laughs> in academic presses. Um my goal has, like, so I'll, I'll tell you a story. So, so here's the thing. Libertarians nowadays are a bigger group than I think we were 20 years ago, right? And, and certainly 40 years ago. I think the libertarian movement started around 50, 60 years ago with Rothbard, Rand, and maybe Isabel Patterson, like the 50s, 60s, but mostly the 60s and 70s. And it was a smaller group. It was more minarchist, not anarchist. So it was radical compared to the mainstream, but not radical like we think of most libertarians now as being anarcho-capitalists or whatever. But it was radical in the sense that it was radical compared to the mainstream, but it was also very intellectual. So, and and by the way, there's only a small set of books you could read to get most of it. Like, I mean, maybe 50 books, 20 books, 50 books, 100 books. But now there's a thousand, you know, or ten thousand, whatever. So it was easy to like get a grasp on all of it. So the earlier intellectuals that I encompassed, I encountered in the the, the, the early '80s when I became part of this, they were all very uh, intellectual. However, they were not quite as radical. Like they were like mostly minarchists, mostly Randians, but at least they appreciated um, intellectual, um, like. Uh, going into depth and in reading the books and, and the sources. The impression I have is that starting around the late 2000s, like 2008 with Ron Paul, he basically radicalized, he, he brought in a bunch of young people to the movement and probably tripled or quadrupled the size of the libertarian movement, which is one reason we're a little bit bigger now. And they're in a way they're more radical because they're more, Austrian, Rothbardian, anarchist, but they're less intellectual. Like they haven't read stuff because of the the way people consume information now. They, they you know they they listen to podcasts and things like that, um, and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a it's a weird combination. It's like we're bigger and we're more radical, but we're less intellectual. And you can see that when you talk to people and you try to go into the the, the details of issues. And their their eyes glaze over, or they just they want to hear like a snapshot answer, like they want like a YouTube clip or something. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, your comments sparked a question. Do you think this that problem is intractable um, of a lack of depth now in the way people learn ideas? Like you and I read books, but you know there are long form conversations. Do you think it's possible that even if people just slowly give up? reading long books do you, do you think they'll still be able to somehow get the depth of an argument in yes. a way that well, yeah, i think so too 
I, th I think so. I, and I think that, uh, yeah, so I think that like the, the change of media and um, the dissolution of the mainstream media and the evolution of podcasting and your own independent channels. Yeah, there's, there's stuff. I mean, in a way, we have an embarrassment of riches right now. We have so many things out there. You can't follow it all. But in a way, that's a good thing. You know, you have Dave Smith and Tom Woods and and uh, all these libertarian groups and free market guys and 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 the liberals the, the 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 old liberals that are becoming new liberals you know like dave rubin and these guys that have given yeah. up on, on the left so there's there's a, a barry weiss people like there's a host of channels of of long form conversations if you really want i mean honestly like i was an electrical engineer but if you wanted to learn it on the internet, you could probably find a, a free MIT course or something online and yeah. learn it. Like there's so much you can learn if you're determined. So I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Uh, I just think it's something we should be aware of. Um, but my point is, I think that we, we have to realize that, especially with the Ron Paul revolution, the character of the movement, it was always partly activist, so the reason I'm bringing this up is I think that activism and you're part of the LP and so am I to this day. Um, that's the activist side of libertarianism. And that's fine. You can criticize it. You can have different views on it. But you have to realize that's not the only part of libertarianism. In fact, libertarianism, I think, starts with liberalism and philosophy and political theory and with ideas. And that's yeah, why man. most get interested in it we get interested in the ideas of liberty and economics and uh, efficiency and uh <laughs> hey, <son>. hey wife <laughs> hi we have we have no door in, in the new office in the new house anyway um uh but my point is this is all fine and i think that what happened was let's say it used to be one third intellectual and two thirds activist maybe half and half i don't know but I feel like today in today's movement, because of the expansion of the movement, because of the Ron Paul stuff and the LP stuff and the American electoral politics, I think it's like 80 percent or the activist types. Like you take the Free State Project. I mean, like you mentioned Porkfest, which I've been to four times now, and I, it didn't even occur to me until the second or the third or fourth time. I mean, they invited me to speak. So I. I go where I get invited to speak. So I went there and I didn't notice that every time I met someone, they were like, Hey, when are you moving to New Hampshire? And I would just blow them off. <laughs> but after the third or fourth meeting, it got to be annoying because it's like, what is this? Some Christian conversion fundamentalist thing where, where you're trying to convert me. Like it's a cult. Like, it's yeah. a cult. And they can do what they want, and that's fine. But it's like, God damn it, if you invite me to speak here, don't pester me every 10 minutes about when I'm moving to New Hampshire. Because the answer is never. I mean, I'm sorry. And that's fine. But my point is, these people are so – so this is one example of the modern incarnation of the movement. You have the activists like the, the Free State Project guys, which who I commend and admire. And you have the LP types, and they're trying to – change things from electoral politics um but they they seem to think that it's all about activism there's like different flavors of it but that's all there is it's like well hold on what about people that are into the ideas and developing the theory um and that's where my goal has always been and so we're getting back to your question about my the book i stumbled across this stuff in law school and earlier and learned enough about law and legal theory and economics and libertarian theory and i thought i could contribute in this area or this area or this area contract theory rights theory whatever so i just wrote in it to be part of the conversation and to develop a theory there's a famous old right thinker which some libertarians probably not a lot of the new, new ron paul guys but the old guys who used to read things like albert j knock um hl mink and these guys but like Albert J. Nock had this this idea of the remnant, and the remnant was this idea that it was a pessimistic view that you know things suck. We're in the dark ages. We're at the decline of the Roman Empire, the modern American Western Empire. We're about to enter dark ages. So all we can do is preserve a little tiny fire of liberty in the writings 
like the remnant and preserve it for the people that will come come after us right um i'm not quite that pessimistic because but but they had a point and i also think it's not that hard to preserve it because of the internet and because of digital information now so there's a a corpus or a core of of of, of pro-liberal thinking economic liberty po po political theory that we have and that we probably won't easily lose unless we have a total decimation of society so i so what i think of is i want to slowly contribute to the corpus of libertarian theory to expand the understanding for people that are interested so that it's there when people finally want to find it so it's not really an activist project in the in the immediate sense of changing you know the, the income tax rate or the minimum wage or tariffs um so my goal is as is to expand libertarian thinking by studying economics, political theory, history, um, all this stuff. And so my book is a comb is is a selection of twenty five articles I wrote over twenty nine years, where I, I gradually built up what I could contribute to contract theory, property theory, rights theory, causation, um, things like this in an integrated way that makes sense and that borrows from and points to other things that have been done. So this is the other thing. When I read these books by smart other libertarian thinkers, it's fine. But a lot of times, like it's just like a 120 page book with no footnotes from some brilliant savant guy. And that's fine. But what it means to me is they're just like a, an outside they're going to be looked at like an outsider crank. They don't know how to engage the literature or to be part of the profession, right? And they don't instill confidence in the reader that they've done their homework. So, yeah, you might have an opinion about how a certain procedure or system might should work, and that's fine. But you're just you're just pontificating from your from your from your couch, from your sofa, from your armchair. Um, it's better to display that you've consumed the entire literature so that at least when you dismiss it it doesn't look like you're dismissing it out of laziness or incompetence or crankishness it's like i've considered it i know it i can overcome it and this is why i'm dismissing it or not using it but one of my friends mentioned he's somewhere and he's with his son and his son is reading my book and he read half of it and he's they've had like 10 conversations already about the points i brought up in the book which he'd never thought of before. And he never thought of them because he didn't write an 800 page book about this stuff. that took 29 years to write and 10 more years to research. Right. But the point is when I read a book, if I get one or two or three good nuggets out of it, to me, that's like a good find. Sure. So if I can inspire five, 10, 15, 20 things that people haven't encountered before, because I put them all together in one thing, that's why I do this stuff. I just do it to preserve the remnant and to advance the, the cause of understanding economics and, and, and libertarian theory. Yeah, 2025. I think you're going to well shoot over that mark for sure. Um, you know, as you were talking, um, I, I think we can do more than just preserve knowledge for the remnant because, yeah, people don't read so much anymore in regards to books, but... I have a young friend who was a straight up Marxist in the middle of COVID and then just on his computer, he started clicking around and reading things and listening to podcasts and articles. And he's a Rothbardian now. I mean, there's so much cross connection and cross poly pollinization and young people are interested in ideas. And so I'm just always surprised when I go somewhere and some 20 something has, you know, it's just nonchalantly throwing names at me. Like, you know, it took me into my thirties and forties to, to read about all these people. Yes, it's kind of yes, awesome. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I don't want to be one of these old fogies who's like, Oh, in the old days it was this. Yeah. There are so many amazing things about the young generation and what they have available to them. Um, you know, I, 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 so I totally agree with you. I, I think that, um, um, there are so many things that you can throw at these people and they can, they can, they can it, like, they, they, you, you might say they have, they might just, you know, you read 15 minutes into a video and then you get distracted by a footnote and you go, to, but that's how we learn. 
you know, yep. we, we follow the trails and, and we, we, yep. we learn things like that. And I, I love that part of, of, of learning and the young learning things. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really impressed. And so I'm, I'm optimistic for the future, which is great. The year before the, the nuclear warheads fall. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't decide whether I want to ask you about intellectual property first or argumentation ethics. I'm going to go with argumentation. Um, I want you to advance the theory and flush it out as best you can, but I want to motivate the discussion by uh, an oblique way I reference it all the time. When I'm talking to people about political theory, libertarianism, and I'm trying to say, you know, the non-aggression principle is valuable. It is a great way for us to allocate resources without conflict. And, I, you know, I, I go through the whole arguments and somebody will just say, well, yeah, but, you know, that's just your opinion. And I've got this other idea. And, yeah, it has to use a little coercion, but we're going to make a better society. And, you know, my, my opinion is different than yours. And who's to say what's right? And what I like to say <laughs> as a preface to a fuller explanation is, well, yeah, OK, but we're just fighting now. Like, if you're not willing to be a libertarian, okay, you can have your opinion, but we are fighting now. And and we're supposed to be getting a political situation where we're not doing that anymore. And I think you're right to choose that before IP. Uh, in my own chronological history, um, argumentation ethics, I'd say around 1988 when I was in law school, was one of my first big insights into libertarian thinking. It was way before I figured out uh, the IP stuff. Um, I think that um, here, here's the way I look at it. Uh, why are we libertarians? Why do we care about liberty? I mean, liberties, liberty and freedom are vague terms. It just means what the ability to do things unencumbered. But that doesn't really say too much because you don't know what you have the freedom to do. Or you don't know what encumbrances of that freedom are legitimate unless you understand basically property rights. So in a sense, property rights is always more fundamental than liberty or freedom, right? But the reason that it intuitively appeals to some of us, and I think to all of us to a degree, it's just to some of us to a higher degree because we're, we're more OCD and we care about consistency and being really, really, really consistent about this stuff is we care about what's right and what's justice. So in my own experience, I was I, I was like a nothing in high school. And then I read Ayn Rand, and she focused on rights and justice and property rights, like what's right. And just this fundamental insight that ultimately you can't ultimately violate someone's rights without using force against them, initiating force, was the fundamental insight that made me understand this stuff. But now it takes a lot of developments to, to apply that to the real world and to apply it to laws and things like that. But it was basically this insight that there's a reciprocity between if you want to actually use force to stop someone from doing something, your use of force has to be justified. And which means it's only justified if it's in response to someone else first starting the force, which is which is sort of the, the intuitive idea behind the idea of non-aggression, which you just mentioned. Um, to my mind, non-aggression is an intuitive principle, which is innate to human nature and social, uh, social interactions, because people have to respect each other's bodies and their own territories. I mean, even dogs know their dog bowls and they, they know their territory. So there's a territory, territoriality aspect to these things. But, um, um, when you say non-aggression and libertarians use that as a stand-in for all of our principles, and then they get attacked by the utilitarians and the, uh, the pragmatists by saying, well, here's an exception to your non-aggression rule. Here's an exception, and here's a case where, where you walked across someone's lawn, and that's not really aggression, is it? So, but, so they try to nitpick these things, and I think the problem is non-aggression – is not exactly what we believe in. Non-aggression is just a shorthand expression for the idea that uh, everyone is the presumptive owner of their body. 
Because aggression really, if you think about it in normal linguistic terms, it just means hitting each other, like with your bodies, one fist against one face or whatever. So if you say you're against aggression, what it means is you shouldn't commit aggression. And why shouldn't you commit that? Because you shouldn't hit someone's body. Well, that implies that they own their body. So when you say non-aggression principle, what you're really saying is body ownership or self-ownership. So, But libertarians believe in more than that. We believe in property rights beyond the body. And when you try to say non-aggression for that, it doesn't quite apply. And then we get attacked by our by our enemies, the socialists, right? Um, so what we have to understand is non-aggression is just a shorthand for the core principle, which is self-ownership or body ownership. And then you have to have other arguments or principles for why that expands and that covers ownership of other things, right? Um, so, for example, if I walk across your lawn, it's not technically aggression because I'm not hitting your body. But it is trespassing. It's violating your property rights. And the reason it's violating your property rights is because every scarce resource can only have one owner, which gives rise to the potential of conflict. And the reason property rights arise in the case of human bodies and in other things is because of this potential for conflict, which is a large subject of the book, my book. Um, and so property rights emerge as norms to allocate ownership rights so that people can live in peace with each other and not trespass. And of course, the property rights in external scarce resources are related to and derive from property rights in your body. And the reason is because you have to own yourself before you're an actor in the world walking around trying to acquire ownership of other things. So it's always so whenever you acquire ownership of these other things in the world that were unowned, like land, trees, fruits, animals, um, the presupposition is that you you're you're an acting agent, you're an owner of your own body. So that's like a that's a different presumption. That's one thing I explore in my book. Everyone assumes that, for example, oh, we believe in John Locke and we believe that if you're the first user of something or if you transformed it by your labor and you created something, all these kind of vague ideas that people just throw out there as like a justification for owning things like I have a better claim to you th to this thing than you do. Um, they, then they say, well, then if I own this this farm because I was the first one to use it, because I homesteaded it, then if you go back one step, then the reason I own my body is because I homesteaded it. But that makes no sense because only an actor can homestead something. And you can't homestead something unless you have a body that you already own and you're wa walking around the earth doing things. So the, the point is, once you understand that, that, that difference, you understand that the, the, the connection to your property right in your body is not based upon homesteading, but based upon something else. It's based upon a more fundamental. So you go back a level, you go up a level. And the level is, why do I own this farm? Why do I own my body? The reason is I have a better link to it than anyone else, a better claim to it. Okay, so now we have to – what's a better claim? In the case of unowned resources, the better claim is I was the first one to use it and establish a connection to it by transforming it with my labor. Okay, so I transformed it. I established a connection to it. But in the case of my body, you, you can't have that because there's no person before the body. So the connection is you have a direct control over your body, right? So in both cases, you're looking for what's the direct link or the direct control. So when you think about things in this way, and it solves lots of legal and political philosophy problems when you finally boil it down to this issue. It's it's all very neat and elegant until Elon Musk uh, um, perfects Neuralink. And so then he owns all our bodies. True. And I'm waiting for Walter Block to write that article to explain why Elon Musk owns us all if he can directly control our brains. One of the things that's so elegant about argumentation ethics is that if we're just having a fight about who gets to control these resources, that's one thing for fighting. But the assumption that we're not doing that, we're sitting there having an argument presupposes that we own it presupposes a bunch of things one that we own our body 
we own the space that we're in so that we can, you know, be in that body. And then a whole bunch of property ownership claims flow from that assumption. Yes. And yeah, I've been talking for a while about argumentation of this and we never really even got to it. So yeah. So, so the, the reason I, I agree with you that that's a better topic to start with an IP is because argumentation ethics is what to me was so the intuitive case and the economic case for libertarianism, um, um, which came first, is I think the way some people get into it, at least I did. But then you start looking for the details, the nooks and crannies. And then when I read Hoppe's argumentation ethics in 88, it blew my mind because it, it made sense to me. It like crystallized the symmetry, the reciprocity of the libertarian ethic, the idea that you can only use force in response to force. So it's, there's a symmetry there, right? There's a reciprocity. That's why the initiation of force is the only true rights violation. And then you get to the stuff we just talked about, the property rights stuff to flesh it out. Because when you say, well, what's the initiation of force? Like are, is walking across your lawn an initiation of force? It's not really an initiation of force, but you can see that it's an extension of the principle. Um, but then the argumentation ethics idea is like, okay, exactly why is this the justified or the only principle uh, why is uh, Hoppe calls his 1988 article in Liberty. So Hans Hermann Hoppe burst on the scene in the mid eighties. He, he was a German student and he came to the U S to study under Rothbard in say 1985. And I think Rothbard died in 1995. So he was here for 10 years with him, but right after he got here, he started uh, extending praxeology and economic Austrian economic theory, but he also was developing libertarian theory and he came up with this argumentation ethics, which was sort of a blend of Mises, Rothbard, natural law, and German philosophers like Jürgen Habermas. And he published it in Liberty Magazine first and got a lot of controversy and criticism from other libertarians. Uh, but he got a, a new admirer from some like me. Um, and his basic argument is that the ultimate justification of the libertarian ethic is that you can't coherently deny it in argumentation. Right. And the reason is because his fundamental point, which I think is overlooked, is that argumentation, which is the attempt to justify uh, a claim, either a factual claim or a normative claim, and there's a difference, and this is Hume's idea. Like, there's a difference between fact and value, and, and is and ought, and 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 normative claims and factual claims. Um, and Hume's insight is that you have to be careful when arguing like natural law thinkers do, and trying to go from here's what is, here's what should be, is to ought. You can't do that without, well, because you're going from a logical one logical realm of facts and is and ought to another i'm sorry facts and is to ought and and value and norms and once you do that once you make that step you have to have a reason for it you can't just introduce it arbitrarily so you can't say man's nature is this and therefore he should do that is is one thing ought is another right so the traditional solution is the natural law solution, the religious solution, which is, well, there's a God and there's a natural order decreed by God and what God says goes. Now, as an atheist, I don't think that really makes sense either because even God himself would be subject to some higher set of law or constraints. And ultimately, uh, what God wants is just his opinion and his value system. Uh, it doesn't mean he's right. <laughs> But so when people talk about what's the purpose of life, what they want is they want some someone above them to tell them what they want them to do. To me, that's not the purpose of life. I don't think there could be a purpose of life, but I'm, then I'm an Austrian. But I can respect the natural law. I can respect this thing because when you go to God, the, the concept of God is, 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 um, is um, encrusted in history in the sense of it, it encodes a lot of traditional – and intuitive and common sense values. And that's what people are really talking about. What they mean is the natural order of things. Right. There are certain systems of human life and social life 
that makes sense for a decent, normal, non-sociopathic human being to live, given our nature as social beings with empathy and with certain finite lifespans and living in a world of scarcity and all this stuff, right? So all that stuff gets encoded in the way uh, society lives. And that, of course, gets encoded in, in religion because religions can't sustain themselves unless they they have a practical aspect. So my point is that's a stand-in. So that's what natural law, but the problem with natural law is, is it ultimately solves with this, it ultimately founders on this is odd gap because you, you can't logically go from an is to an odd. Do you read any Michael humor? I've read humor. I'm, I, I'm not so far a fan of intuitionism. Um, I'm a fan. <laughs> well, I need, I need, I need to read more of his book. Uh, I, well, I, I, Michael humor, uh, 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 is not opposed to intellectual property. So to my mind, that shows that I don't really know what his, his under her, his, his philosophical underpinnings are, but if he can't as an allegedly um, fairly systematic, brilliant libertarian, systematic thinker, philosopher, if he can't figure out that IP is bad, then th there's some flaw in his edifice. Okay. Well, Stefan, nobody's perfect. But I did just read his book on epistemology, and it's pretty good. That's fine, and he, it may be. But I'm just saying that this is this is this is like saying, "Oh, I'm a libertarian anarchist, but um, whether cocaine should be illegal or not, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on it." It's like, come on, dude, this is an obvious one. It's a no-brainer. Um, the fact that he doesn't have an obvious answer to IP shows me that there's some flaw, some gap in his property rights theory. Which is not to say there's nothing of value and whatever, but no, I, I haven't studied enough of his stuff to, to know. Well, I do recommend it. Okay, well, uh, yeah, what, I forget what his book is. It's, uh... Well, he's got three. Um, the first I read was The Problem of Political Authority. And then the second one I read of his was uh, something about ethical intuitionism. And then I just read a book, I think it's just called Epistemology. Um, and I'm not trying to say the man's right about absolutely everything, but I, I think his ideas in there are very worth contending with. Well, I, I suspect that um, to the extent it makes sense, um, there's a lot of overlap between these different approaches, and I think they yes. all dovetail yes. towards the range, the same solution. So you, yes. you'll have you'll have a consequentialist or utilitarian, or a Milton Friedmanite, or a um, uh, you know, a, a, a deontological Randian or a natural law type or a Kantian. And and a lot of them say that, oh, it's this or the other. And I, I've never believed that. Um, I don't know how to prove it. But I've always thought that it's like the elephant analogy, you know, like I agree. five guys, they're feeling an elephant. They're all describing the same thing, but they're coming at it from different angles. But if we're talking about the same reality, we're going to converge on the same um, – description or solution ultimately so i i, I and, and ayn rand hinted at that when she said that the, the moral is the practical yeah you know and, and I, I do believe that um i, I don't know how to prove it i don't know how to prove it but that's that's what i believe so i think that intuitionism um consequentialism uh, princ the principle or deontological approach i think they all converge to the same ideas because we're ultimately a community. We're ultimately a community of human beings that have most of us that are not sociopaths have shared fundamental values, which I call um, grun norms. After oh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we had that functionality. <laughs> there, there's hand gestures now and all these. Okay, um, there's there's grun norms. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, but th there's basic values that most normal human beings share. Like we all want peace, prosperity, you know, cooperation, things like that. So once you share these values and once you have a modicum of understanding of economics, you know, free market, just basic Henry Hazlitt free market economics uh, and a little bit of understanding of history and the way political systems work you have enough to become a pretty radical libertarian because we all want the same things. Mostly we want peace and prosperity for everyone. Like I think even socialists want that. They just 
are confused about the nature of politics and, and economics. They think that you can achieve these things by this way. Right. And they're just wrong. And, and if they just a little bit economically, I mean, look, when I was younger, I used to like, like we we're talking about activism earlier. I'm still an activist, as you know, I'm part of the LP like you are. I'm skeptical of, of electoral politics and activism to ever achieve anything. My, my, my view is we have to just wait for humanity to evolve. 10, well, I think years part of that we... evolution is education, right? And culture and rubbing off on other people. I mean, we do Correct. have influence. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening and or watching to Heyman Nature. I really hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Stefan Kinsella. Um, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. I know that's an annoying thing to say, and I cringe a little bit saying it myself, but it really does help promote the show. So if you would like and subscribe, I would be greatly appreciative. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.